Welcome, everybody. This is uh, Reverend John Ferret of Light of Menorah Ministries. And so not only will I say welcome to you, but also shalom. And welcome to this Zoom Bible study on the vine and the branches. By the way, I wanted to let you know, um, with regards to the screen that you're looking at, you're actually looking at some icons that are on my, my uh, high-definition video camera. I'm not using my webcam. So you may see some icons. Don't pay attention to them. I'm trying to sit right in the middle. Those are just icons on my camera. And what I normally like to do is I like to do a blessing to God before we start any Bible study. That was so common in Jesus's day. Now, I'm going to say this blessing in Hebrew and in English. Um, I would say normally if I was doing a live class, I'd say repeat after me, but all your microphones are muted, but uh, I'll say it slow enough that you may want to uh, actually say it with me. Baruch hata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haholam, Ashir bakar banu, Mikol hahamim, Veinatan lanu et toroto, Veinevoim hatovim, Veinatan lanu et habasora, Mashiach Yeshua. Veinatan lanu et habret chadasha. Barukata aronai noten hadevere emet. We'll now say that in English. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and given us his Torah and the good prophets, given us the good news of Messiah Jesus, given us the new covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the words of truth. So what is Light of Menorah Ministries? It's a Bible teaching ministry, and I teach the Bible in its historical context one way of looking at that is this. If we're, we're going to be going back to Jesus' day, that's 2,000 years ago. So indeed, we're saying, what do the disciples hear then? When they hear Jesus, what do they hear? Not us. So what do they hear then? On top of that, when they're hearing Jesus' words about the vine and the branches or many other things, or even Moses or even David, what did they understand then? In other words, this is the original audience that God presents his words to. So for us, we can more fully comprehend the vine and the branches, Psalm 23 or whatever. Now, we have a very good idea about the meaning of many of these things, but we're limited because we want to put this entire text back into its historical context. Let me give you an example. I, uh, as you can see on your screen, I'm showing you the title of an article, Biblical Archaeology Review. It's called The Undiscovered Gate Beneath Jerusalem's Golden Gate. So Biblical Archaeology Review, January, February 1983 issue. So some of you have been to Israel, and you might recognize that if this is the eastern wall uh, there of the Temple Mount and the old city behind it. And you'll see a gate. And that gate is very famous. It was built by the Emperor Suleiman, a Muslim emperor of the Ottoman Empire in the 1600s, our 1600 AD, not BC. And it just so happens that an archaeologist um, uh, was walking by here, and his name was Dr. Fleming, when he was a student at Hebrew University. And you can see the left arch. He was walking very, very close to the gate in the left arch. And the pavement that he was walking on actually collapsed. And he fell about 15 feet into a hole. And this is the hole. He actually had his camera with him. And he took this picture. What it was was a Muslim tomb. And it was uh, part of the tomb that actually broke. But what he noticed was this, and you'll see a red line go, going across your screen. He saw an arch of a gate, an arch of a gate that was below the gate where Suleiman actually built that in his wall. Archaeologists got so excited that indeed what they believe they have found is the eastern gate 
into the temple that would have been there in Jesus's day. So what we saw was the gate that Jesus would have entered when he came for Passover or he came for the Feast of Tabernacles. You're seeing that here in this diagram. You can see the tomb right there in the center of your picture, the Muslim tomb, and the floor collapsed. And he fell through that. And so he was basically lying on bones looking at the actual top arch uh, of the gate. This then takes us to Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 through 5, reading from the New American Standard Bible. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was coming from the way of the east. And his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. I'll stop there. You can read more about this, but in Ezekiel chapter 43, Ezekiel is seeing a vision of a future temple. In Judaism, this is a verse that describes supposedly the coming of the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah is going to be coming from the east and coming through the eastern gate. Here's another verse dealing with perhaps the eastern gate in the New Testament. And this is in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. So indeed, here's an artist's rendering of the beggar right outside the gate, and uh, Peter is uh, walking in, and indeed, he's asking for alms. So Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he seized him up, or raised him up, <clears throat> and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. <clears throat> with a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them. That's important. Walking and leaping and praising God. So indeed, Peter and John are walking in with the beggar. He's walking and leaping. He is really excited. And I believe that an argument could be made that the beautiful gate that's mentioned here in Acts could very well be the eastern gate. Maybe in future Zoom Bible studies or videos, I may actually talk about the temple and the various gates. The eastern gate allows you into the temple mount, but there's another gate that allows you into the temple area. And either the eastern gate or that gate is called a beautiful gate. So there's a debate among archaeologists which gate it could be. It could very well be this one, because remember what it said, the beggar got up and he entered the temple. So here we have archaeology, history, customs, culture. Customs and culture really call the Jewish roots of our faith or the languages of the ancient Near East. And what this does, just by this one small example, it verifies that the temple was there in Jesus' day. So this is huge, only for the simple reason this comes against what you would hear Palestinian Arabs say today in uh, Israel and in the West Bank, that the temple was never there and the Jews never had a temple. So indeed, archaeology, history, geography, customs and culture and languages uh, indeed is huge with regards to understanding the Bible, and that's just one small example using that archaeology. The vine and the branches, the grapevine, one and Messiah, and indeed we're going to be emphasizing archaeology, history, geography, the customs and culture of the Jewish roots of our faith, the languages of the ancient Near East. So we know I am the true vine is in John 15, 1 through 8, and I want to start with a little bit of archaeology. You're looking at an artist's rendering of a village of what it would look like in Jesus' day. And what I want you to notice is the fields. Right in front of you is an olive uh, grove. There's some olive, other olive groves on the other side of the village. And there are probably some wheat fields out there and barley fields and probably some vineyards. The point being here is this. In Jesus' day, especially, obviously in the farmland, Farmers, vine dressers, they lived in town. They did not live on a farmhouse like they do in Minnesota or Iowa on their farm, in the midst of their farm. 
they were actually in town. They left town in the morning from their homes and they went out to their proper fields. That's an important point. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So indeed, let's read John 15, one through eight. And again, reading from the New American Standard Bible, I'm the true vine and my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather him and cast him into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified in this. Now, this is an important statement. My father is glorified in this. Bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. You guys, the vine and the branches, what's it all about? What is a disciple of Jesus? So indeed, when we take a look at the vine and the branches, we're taking a look at Jesus' teaching about what it means to be a disciple. Look at that. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. We're going to come back to this, indeed, at the end. And the other thing that's important, Jesus is teaching this at the Last Supper. In the Gospel of John, this starts in John chapter 13, and John chapter 14, and 15, 16, etc. And John chapter 15 is being, these are the words of Jesus, being taught in his Last Supper, which means based upon perhaps how the gospels give it an indication, these disciples of Jesus have been with him definitely for at least two years and probably three years. That's also important as we go more into this lesson. Now, when we look at vineyards in Jesus's day, there are a lot of different types. Here's one that you can actually visit in, in Israel today, and the vines are not tied up. They're actually laying on the ground, and rocks are used to lift up the vines and the branches. Another type was on the hillside. Those of you that have been to Israel know that they have terraced farming, and here is a vineyard in Israel, and you can see the vines. They're not even tied up, but there they are on the various levels along the hillside. This is called a gan uh, on the way up to the top of the hill. So let's go back to Israel, and we're going to consider the father is the vine dresser. So he is the one that comes out of his home. He's the place that comes out of his boat. It's like God coming out of heaven, and he does a whole bunch of stuff for us. Look what he does. And Jesus, matter of fact, because we are one with Jesus, and Jesus is one with us. He tills the soil. He removes the stones. He builds a wall and a watchtower around the vineyard. And uh, so builds and builds the uh, the watchtower in the vineyard, and for the build, building the walls to keep the animals out that feed on vines and grapes. So indeed, here is a picture of a wall around the vineyard. And I was in this modern application that indeed that the vine dresser is trying to keep out certain animals that would come in, uh, and indeed maybe other people from you know walking over his land. Here's a watchtower. Uh, one of my pictures that I took at uh, Yad Shemona, a hotel uh, in the mountains of Jerusalem, and the community would actually share in the watchtower, watching over the fields of not only their fields, but their neighbors' fields as well. And that is obviously to try to make sure a thief doesn't enter and steal the fruit once it's ripe, because they can make a little money by taking it to the market. The vine dresser also put up a sharp hedge of thorns to protect the young grapes from the fox, which likes to feed on the early grapes. Soft, the fox has a soft belly, and indeed he's not going to jump over the hedge of protection. This is a dragon thorn bush, and I went to a website that is home uh, plants used for home protection. Ladies and gentlemen, this website talks about 
thorn bushes still used as a hedge of protection for our homes. And indeed, this thorn bush is something else. But what's fascinating is this. I've experienced this, and perhaps you have, where we say, I'm going to pray a hedge of protection over this person. What's really fascinating is this. If we're disciples of Jesus, and we're hearing Jesus teach us the vine and the branches, the vine dresser, the Father, has already put a hedge of protection around each of us. That's fascinating. We don't have to pray for a hedge of protection. It's there. So for me, when I'm in those situations, I'll say, thank you, Lord God, for putting a hedge of protection around my friend who had cancer. You're taking care of him. Lord God, I need to pray for a hedge of protection around my office because I have to teach this Bible study. It's already here. I don't have to pray for it. I thank you. This is all about the Father coming out of his abode in the heavens of the heavens and coming to us and doing everything he can to help us. Indeed, I love this verse in Matthew 6.8. It's the very words of God. T-V-W-O-G. I use that a lot, the very words of God. The Father already knows what you need before you even ask. Why? Jesus is giving us the picture. He's the vine dresser, and he can observe us the branches of the vine. Looking at another vineyard on a hillside, you can see the grape vines in front of you where the actual branches are hanging over the wall. And obviously that's where the grapes would be as well. They're not tied up like on a, on a trellis. trellis. Israel is a vineyard on a hill, fertile hillside. And this is where the true vine, the true vine, Jesus, was going to be planted. I'm going to be highlighting Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, because there's something very important in here I want to talk about. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a, vine, a vineyard on a hill. This is the vine dresser. This is God. And he dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with choice vines. He built a tower in the middle of it. He also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it only produced worthless ones. And now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done it, done for it? Why, when I expected to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? And then later on, as we get into the end of this verse, he breaks down the wall, he removes the hedge. The hedge of protection that he actually put around the vineyard, he removes. And guess who the vineyard is? It's Israel. He was really upset. This was, was, a, this was a, a word of God by Isaiah against Israel and the practices of their ungodly practices at that time. So when we look at this vineyard, we consider that God has created his vineyard. He's done everything he needs for the vineyard. But they produced worthless grapes. The Hebrew word there is be'ushin. We have the wrong comprehension from the words worthless grapes. It's be'ushin. These are grapes, offensive to the smell, noxious, poisonous, useless. When the branches touch the ground, it's likely that they will produce grapes that are like that. You can see those ugly-looking, terrible grapes that are be'ushin. You don't even want to touch them practically. The branches must be lifted up to produce good fruit. The branch is not cut off. It's a good branch. Now, I want to make a comment here. We're reading in the actual word where it says, any branch in me that does not bear uh, fruit uh, is taken away. Now, I have been to uh, vineyards all over the world, and indeed, I've talked to vine dressers right here in Minnesota at St. Croix Vineyards. And the vine dresser, the owner of the vineyard at St. Croix Winery, told me that if there's a branch that's producing be'oshim, worthless grapes, they don't cut it off. They don't take it away. They lift it up. They tie it up. And in this way, the branch next year will probably produce good grapes. 
Here you're looking at a picture when I was in Egypt with my good friend, Pastor George. You can see him there on the left doing a lesson on this. This is a vineyard of a poor Bedouin farmer. And he actually had his vineyard, this poor Bedouin farmer. We're, we're in Jordan right now. We're on the other side of the Jordan River. And this is vineyards as of old. In other words, these vines were actually on the ground. They were not tied up. This was a poor farmer. He probably did not have the money to actually buy all the wood and wire and rope that he needs to tie up his vines. So therefore, you have the vines on the ground, and we found grapes, ripe grapes. There in That was June when we were there at the end of June, uh, even in that hot climate. And these grapes, there they were. They were laying on the ground, not the branch. The grapes were lying on the ground. So yeah, maybe some of them could become spoiled because of that. But indeed, what happens is the farmer lift up his branches so the ends of the branch do not create little suckers that come out of them and start going to the ground to actually suck out the nutrients from the soil. You don't want that because then the branch be can become diseased and produce bet ushim. So indeed, you have to be lifted up. Here I am in Mexico teaching this exact lesson. And you know, in modern vineyards, in Mexico, all over the world, the branches are actually tied up. So you can see my students from uh, the um, uh, Bible Institute there in uh, Vicente Guerrero on the Baja. And you can see all the vine branches with all of the vine or the branches actually tied up. And again, here we see that picture of the branch being lifted up. So again, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. How wrong can one be? Now, what I'm getting, this is coming from vine dressers. This is coming from people who actually grow grapes. So indeed, the Greek word there is aero. This is from Thayer's Greek lexicon, and it means to raise up to elevate, to lift up. Now, Jesus is speaking Hebrew. He's not speaking Aramaic. And so the Hebrew word there is nasa, to lift up. So indeed, uh, when you have a branch that's not producing fruit, there could be something wrong. It's still attached to the vine. And so they lift it up. And next year, God willing, it will become a healthy branch and will be able to produce good grapes. So again, there it says, in every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Now, there's a very interesting way of looking at this. We, if we're sinners, as a branch, it's like we're touching the ground. Sin sucks the life out of us, the life of Jesus, the life of the branch, our life in Messiah that's in us, our fruit, us, and the fruit that we're supposed to produce becomes bet ushim, it becomes worthless and spoiled. But if we repent, and confess our sins, the vine dresser comes and he's faithful and compassionate and he nasas our sin. He lifts it up, he takes it away. He lifts us up and we are cleansed. That is just so awesome. And that's a lesson, indeed, understanding geography, the geography of growing grapes in Israel today the geography of growing grapes in Jesus' day, and also even in our own area. We need to talk to people who know how to grow grapes because the message for us is just amazing. Here's me again back in Mexico with my students from the Bible Institute. And you are beginning to see there two, two, two things I wanted you to see. You're seeing a brand new vine there right in front of me. It's only got one branch. Notice it's tied up already to the uh, line that goes across. And right next to it, off to the right, right next to the pole, is a vine that's two years old. Now, here, branches, the, the, these are mature branches. Uh, obviously, you can see the branches themselves, the beautiful grapes. They're not Be'ushim. And if you look closely there on the left side on that branch, you can see that it's tied up. Indeed, vine dressers are going to tie up their branches today so that they do not touch the ground and produce worthless grapes. Now, I'm going to go to the first five books of the Bible, and there is a law that God establishes. It's in Leviticus 19, 
verses 23 through 25. And again, from the New American Standard, when you enter the land and plant all kinds of trees for food, then you shall count their fruit as forbidden. Isn't this interesting? Planting not only trees, but also vines, because that's fruit. It's a fruit vine, grapes. Look at this, three years, it shall be forbidden. Okay? Now, one thing I want to let you know, this is food that it's forbidden. There's also the fact that there is, in the Bible, as you know, foods that are forbidden to Israel. We talk about the kosher laws. They can't eat lobster. Uh, they can't eat pepperoni or pork. Okay? That is unclean food. It's forbidden. This is almost like grapes in the first three years are unclean. The branches are unclean. They're just not ready. But please understand, grapes are clean food. They're fruit. So it's not saying that they're unclean. They're just forbidden. So this gives us a connection to saying, wow, this is almost like they're unclean. Matter of fact, the word here for forbidden is uncircumcised. They're not even part of it. If somebody's uncircumcised, they're not even part of the Jewish family. They're not even part of the Jewish nation. So these grapes are really cut off. They're like unclean. So they're forbidden to you. You shall not eat them. But in the fourth year, all of its fruit shall be holy. An offering of praise to the Lord. In the fifth year, you are to eat of its fruit, that its yield may increase for you. I am the Lord your God. Now remember, Jesus is teaching this at the Lord's Supper. Remember what it said in the Torah law. You cannot eat the grapes in the first three years. The disciples are branches of the true vine. They've been with Jesus for at least two years and probably definitely three years. Three years. And what does Jesus say about them? You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Three years, they're ready. And on top of that, it's the fourth year. I like to look on this as the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost, which is going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes upon the 120 disciples. It's the beginning of year four. And the church begins in that fourth year to live for God's praise and glory. It's right out of the Torah. Now remember this. At the Last Supper, when Jesus is teaching this, they did not have the New Testament. The New Testament wasn't even written yet. All they had was the Torah. And Jesus says, this is something to take a look at in John 5.39. John 5.39, Jesus says that indeed all the scriptures testify of me. He says that when there was no Torah, when, when there was no New Testament, only the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, only the Old Testament. So we take a look at a picture of a vine with its branches. And indeed, we go to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, let me do this very quickly. I'm going to stop sharing. And let me grab my Bible so I can read it exactly. We read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. So, one of the things that we realize, and we're saved by grace. In other words, we become a new branch. We're new in Christ. We know that, that we're new in Christ. New creatures, a new branch. We're a new disciple. We're part of the vine now because we chose Jesus as our vine. There are other vines out there. Lies of Satan worldviews and religions that are anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible. But for us, we, with our own free will, we choose Jesus 
as the true vine, and we become a new branch. We're new in Christ. We're saved by grace. And we can't earn it. It's a gift. How do you become a branch? You're only a growth that comes out of the vine. You can't do this on your own. It's part of the vine. The vine does it. Jesus did it because of the cross and through the cross and through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. We are able to be saved by grace and become a branch of the true vine. It's a gift. But, and this is where the church seems to stop reading Ephesians chapter 2. They don't go into verse 10. We're God's worksmanship. God is working. He's the vine dresser. Yes, God is coming out of his abode. He's coming out of his town, out of the highest heavens where he dwells. He's the vine dresser. He's coming to us. He's working on us. He's working on the vineyard. And we are saved to do good works. Those good works don't save us. We're already saved. Now, the Greek word here that's used for works can also mean, and I love this, a task, an endeavor, or a profession. We have been saved up for a good profession. Ladies and gentlemen, our good profession is to be a fruitful branch of the true vine. That's our profession. That's our occupation. That's our good works. And this is the product. This is what we're supposed to have come out of us. But we do this together with Jesus. We can't do this on our own. This is so cool because a vine needs branches. And the vine and the branches together produce the fruit. Because the life of the vine moves through the branches and therefore produces the fruit. And remember, at the Last Supper, Jesus says this. This is in John 14. Jesus says, remember that in that day you will know I'm in the Father. Well, we get that. It's almost like you're saying the vine dresser has come around his vineyard, and here's the vineyard that the Father controls, the vine dresser controls. Jesus is in the Father. And he said, but you're in me. Yes, we're branches of the true vine. Jesus does that. This is in John 14, and in John 15, he's talking about that connection between the branches and the vine. And we're in him. Yes, take a look at the place where the branch and the vine are connected. If you actually went inside the plant, you could hardly even tell where the branch starts and the vine starts and the branch ends and the vine ends. They're together as one where that connection is. But the branch grows. This is what disciples should do with the life of Jesus flowing through us. Just amazing. So Jesus is teaching at the Last Supper. Indeed, in that day you will know that I'm in the Father. You're in me. And then he says something amazing. And I'm in you. When I take a look at the vine and the branches, I get it. His life is in us. Jesus is in us. By the way, somebody ever ask you, who dwells in us? Many of you will probably say, based upon 1 Corinthians 3.16, well, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Uh, we have a problem. The scripture says Jesus dwells in us right here. I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. So we got the Holy Spirit and Jesus dwelling in us. God, the fullness of God. Amazing. With Jesus, as disciples of Yeshua, is to produce fruit. And there we go. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Until next time, I wish you shalom and look forward to another day when we can do another Bible study. God bless.